the 12th of March, 1938, the strangest invasion in history begins. German tanks roll across the border into Austria. They're welcomed by smiling civilians who greet the German Fuhrer, Adolf Hitler, as a hero. This is the moment when the countdown to the Second World War begins. The decisions and actions Hitler takes over the next 18 months will drag the world to war. Without him, there would be no Second World War. No Holocaust, no senseless killing of millions of people. To understand how it happened, we need to understand him. In this series, we're telling the story of these 18 months, from the 12th of March, 1938, to the 3rd of September, 1939, through the eyes of Hitler himself. Revealing how this bully, gambler, and arch manipulator brought the world to the edge of destruction. cold morning and you might imagine this would discourage people from coming onto the streets but it doesn't. The streets are just lined with thousands upon thousands of people celebrating. They're throwing flowers. They're rapturous in excitement that Hitler and his troops are here. It's more like a victory parade than an invasion. Hitler is more like a movie star than a politician. The crowds are so thick it takes four hours for Hitler's driver to complete the 74-mile journey to Linz, the town where he grew up. Hitler is Austrian by birth. This is a true homecoming. Hitler receives a fantastic welcome in Linz. The church bells are ringing and he's standing in his car, waving and smiling and giving the Hitler salute. This is one of the moments in Hitler's career where he really shows emotion. He normally kind of internalises everything and keeps an iron face at all times, but at this moment, the tears are running down his cheek. So happy is he to see the response from the people of Linz. On the balcony of the town hall, he tells the assembled crowd, that Providence has chosen him to unite Austria and Germany. He believes that this is his dream fulfilled, this is his desire, and he feels that this is everything that he's worked towards throughout his career. For Hitler, this is the realisation of a long-standing ambition. He's been planning this ever since he came to power in January 1933. Hitler has expansionist ideas. He wants to build a new fatherland. He wants to build a new Germany. One of Hitler's key aims has always been the creation of a greater German Reich, an ethnically pure empire that would eventually extend across Central and Eastern Europe. Hitler doesn't just want Austria, Czechoslovakia, Poland, and even the Soviet Union are all in his sights. Austria is the obvious place for Hitler to begin. Germans and Austrians are linked by language, by culture, some would argue by ethnicity. There's been this long-standing desire to unite Austria and Germany, which is why they're so welcoming. The next day, Hitler attends to some personal business. He visits his parents' grave. 
and takes the advantage of a useful photograph opportunity. He never, never foregoes an opportunity for a good photo. And this one, going back to his homeland, his place of his birth, the grave of his parents, this is obviously a wonderful photo opportunity, and Hitler is not going to miss out on that. While he's in Linz, he signs the reunification of Germany and Austria. Now, this is a myth. Germany and Austria have never been united before. But Hitler claims that this is a reunion. He is restoring the racial union, the national union of the German-speaking peoples. And this is a classic example of Hitler manipulating history to serve his present agenda. Austria is now a province of Germany, ruled by Hitler. Business complete. It's back to the victory tour. Next stop is the Austrian capital, where the reception is even more euphoric. When he actually gets into the main square, the so-called Heroes Square, ironically speaking, there are 200,000 Austrians. And when Hitler goes out onto the balcony of the Hotel Imperial, he's met by this incredibly enthusiastic crowd that keeps cheering and keeps forcing him to come out and acknowledge their cheers. Hitler is thrilled and delighted, but his triumph tastes that much sweeter because when he was last in Vienna, he was a nobody, ignored by his fellow countrymen. Hitler's at his lowest ebb. He's been reduced to sleeping on park benches, begging. Hitler is 20 years old. He's been in Vienna for two years. He comes to the capital with the idea of pursuing an artistic career. He tries to enroll in the School of Fine Arts, but he's rejected. Hitler has a self-inflated view of his own talents, but really he doesn't put in the hard graft to actually do the work to achieve his dreams. He's rather lazy, and this is something we'll see later in his career as well. So there's kind of almost a sense of not really seeing this through to the end and not much sort of sense of purpose. He admits that during his time in Vienna, this was the lowest period of my life. And it really was, you know, imagine him lonely, isolated. He's got no friends. He feels embittered. This life on the streets certainly isn't the life of acclaim. Hitler's dreamt of. He sees himself as a big man, a hero. And today, in March 1938, Hitler's youthful fantasies have finally become a glorious reality. This is the greatest day of his entire life. Here he is back in Vienna, where he's been at his lowest point. He's turned his life around. He's now the Führer of the greater German Reich. And when he stands on the balcony at the Imperial Hotel, it's a watershed moment for Hitler because he suddenly starts to really believe in his own genius. Might have been slightly in check beforehand, but it's certainly not now. It's completely unleashed. Hitler now thinks he's unstoppable. Austria is just the beginning and he's already plotting his next move. While Hitler stands on the balcony of the Hotel Imperial, soaking up the adulation of the Austrian people, elsewhere in Vienna, violence is spreading through the streets. Pretty much as Hitler arrives in Vienna, there's an outbreak of anti-Semitic violence. Jewish shops are targeted, cars are wrecked, and Jewish people are beaten in the streets and also forced to scrub the streets on their hands and knees. Anti-Semitism has a very long history in Austria. 
but Hitler's arrival legitimizes violence on the streets and the humiliation of the Jews as well. Hitler is known as an anti-Semite, and anti-Semitism is a big part of Nazi ideology. Hitler has long blamed the Jewish population for Germany's ills. He believes that the German Empire should be pure and untainted by the Jewish population. The violence on the streets of Vienna is a savage reminder of the darkness that lies at the heart of Hitler's beliefs. On the morning of the 16th of March, Hitler flies back to Berlin. He's greeted by more cheering crowds. Everybody in Berlin seems to be out in the streets to yell delight as Hitler returns to the capital. This is an extraordinary outpouring of love that most politicians can only dream of. Hitler's very popular with the German people because he's seen as having restored Germany to its former greatness, not only domestically but internationally too. You have to continually remind yourself of the truly pitiful state that Germany found herself in, firstly after the First World War, and secondly after the effects of the Great Depression. When Hitler comes to power in 1933, Germany's in economic despair, and he promises to make Germany great again, and he does that. Hitler has delivered an economic miracle. He's basically returned Germany to almost full employment. He's got the economic system going again. He's built the Autobahn. He's managed to fund lots of public initiatives and rearm Germany. But he's also given the Germans back their self-respect on a world stage. And this bloodless coup by attaching Austria to Germany is really a wonderful moment for the Germans and a chance for them to be proud about themselves again. Suddenly Hitler looks like the shining star, the perfect embodiment, even God-given embodiment of the new Germany. By 1938, Hitler mania absolutely has taken hold of Germany. You know, people are just sort of thinking, my God, you know, he's the new messiah. I think in terms of politics, you've got to say that Hitler is the first political rock star. You have Hitler cakes, you have Hitler roses, you have cafes, shops, restaurants being named after Hitler. They are even spending a lot of money and time to go in droves to Bechtesgaden, which was his holiday retreat in the Bavarian Alps, in the hope of just catching a, a little glimpse of Hitler. It's hardly surprising that on this cold March day in Berlin, Hitler feels all-powerful. In his mind, he can now do anything he wants. Three days later, Hitler is in the splendor of his HQ, the Reich Chancellery in Berlin. He's poring over maps of Europe with his right-hand man and propaganda chief, Joseph Goebbels. One of the great ironies about the leading Nazis is that none of them look like the Aryan stereotype. Hitler looks nothing like the Aryan ideal that he talks about, the blonde, blue-eyed, strong, muscular, ideal specimen of the Aryan male. He's relatively short, about five foot nine. He has brown hair. He's not exactly muscular. He's, in fact, quite doughy-featured. Joseph Goebbels is similarly an Aryan. Goebbels is a rather sort of small figure. He's got a club foot, and any kind of deformity is very much frowned upon in Nazi ideology. But what he has in abundance is an extraordinary talent for PR and spin. I mean, he is the original spin doctor. Now Hitler's got something important he wants to discuss with Goebbels. Hitler explains to him that the next item on the agenda is the Sudetenland. The Sudetenland is the western, southwestern, and northwestern fringe of Czechoslovakia, which comprises approximately three and a quarter million ethnic Germans. 
The sedating Germans feel oppressed by the Czechs and they desperately desire to be unified with Germany. Hitler's all too happy to oblige, but he tells Goebbels he's eyeing up more than just the Sudetenland. In private, Hitler has much more far-reaching aims and ambitions, and in fact, what he really wants is the whole of Czechoslovakia and nothing less. He thinks that Czechoslovakia is a great gateway to the east. It also contains rich minerals and armaments that Hitler feels will benefit the greater German Reich. Hitler doesn't set a date for an attack, but he's determined to take Czechoslovakia this year. And if he has to use force to get it, that's what he'll do. Hitler's not afraid of war. War has made him the man he is. Hitler is marching with his regiment through a forest in the Belgian countryside. He's about to experience his first time in combat as a soldier in the First World War. Hitler's regiment is tasked with capturing a series of farms held by the British. The German army charge on the farmhouses and Hitler sees his comrades fall around him, being gunned and being shelled. He himself manages to get through this into a trench. He's fighting hand to hand with the British. A bullet rips through Hitler's sleeve, but he remains undeterred. This experience, while it's shocking, at the same time, it's incredibly exhilarating. And most importantly, he survives it. This moment changes Adolf Hitler's life. His wartime experience transforms his character and beliefs. It fuels his nationalism and patriotism. It gives him a sense of fulfillment. But at the same time, he becomes indifferent to human suffering. But there's also a sense, an absolute conviction in him that war is the solution to most countries and races' problems. The belief that the strongest and the fittest will survive and the weakest don't deserve to survive. For Hitler, war becomes a glorious ideal and something to aspire to. So, 20 years later, Hitler's more than ready to launch another war to get his hands on Czechoslovakia. He moves on to the next stage in his plan. In Berlin, he's holding a critical meeting with the leader of the Sudeten German party of Czechoslovakia. Konrad Henlein is a rather unprepossessing figure, he's a bespectacled former school teacher, but he's very ruthless in uh, his advocacy for the state and German cause, and he's utterly committed to Nazism. What Hitler wants Henlein to do is to request the Czech government to give the Sudeten Germans full independence in the hope that the Czech government will actually refuse and that then he would have an opportunity to have his war and really to take over the whole of Czechoslovakia. Hitler's using Henlein because he's keen not to look like the aggressor. Hitler, on the public stage, says that he's a man of peace. He doesn't want any future war. Hitler knows he has to play a careful game. Hitler doesn't want to provoke Britain and France, certainly not until he's ready. He knows he can take on the Czechs in battle, but not the military power of the British and the French too. Hitler can be reasonably sure, however, by this point that Britain and France won't intervene. He knows Britain and France don't want a war, so it's in their interests not to respond militarily to Germany's increasingly aggressive position. So he's treading a careful line of giving the public image that he wants to, yet in reality he wants this war and he wants Germany to expand more and more and more. Hitler is kind of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And what we're getting between 1933 and 38 is Dr. Jekyll. It's the nice Hitler. It's the accommodating Hitler. But what we get from then onwards, we get the real Hitler. We get Mr. Hyde. 
and Hitler's Mr. Hyde is about to be unleashed. Friday the 20th of May 1938 is a beautiful day and Hitler is at the Berghof at Berchtesgaden. This is his picturesque holiday home, perched high in the Bavarian mountains. But a telegram arrives that shatters the peace. News arrives that the Czechs are mobilizing as they've been spooked by reports that Germany is preparing to invade. Hitler is completely taken by surprise. Yes, he is planning an invasion, but later in the year, he's not planning it now. And in fact, those reports of German troop movements were false. But the British and French don't know this, and they're not happy with Hitler. Britain and France send a message to Hitler saying that if there is any German aggression towards Czechoslovakia, that they will get involved. And the result of all of this is that Hitler begins to row back a little bit by assuring both the British and the French that there will not be an invasion. The Czechs are obviously ready to fight if their land is invaded, but at the present time, it seems as if wise counsel will prevail and this pleasant country be spared the horror of war. The situation is calmed. But in the following days, Hitler's infuriated by international press reports, suggesting he's backed down under pressure from the Western powers. Hitler is absolutely furious that he's been made to look weak, that Germany has been made to look weak. It's incredibly humiliating for him, and this is not a feeling that Hitler likes at all, and you could trace this, of course, all the way back to his lower middle-class roots. Adolf Hitler is not part of the German upper class, nor is he part of the German officer class. He never reached um, a commissioned rank. He was a non-commissioned corporal, and Everybody knew that he was a non-commissioned corporal. Hitler is very insecure, in particular in his relations with other international leaders who tend to be from a better educated, more middle-class background than Hitler. The humiliation makes Hitler even more determined to invade Czechoslovakia and take the Sudetenland and beyond. He'll show them who's in charge. On the 28th of May, Hitler assembles his generals and tells them that it is now his unalterable will to smash the Czech nation by force of arms and that they must prepare military plans. But some of his generals are not happy. Ludwig Beck is the chief of the German general staff. He's a man of integrity, an old-style general, you might say. What he doesn't want to do is get embroiled in a big war that Germany can't win. And he feels that Britain and France might well come in on the Czechoslovakian side, and it'll end to um, a Second World War, which Germany will ultimately lose. One of the things that Beck does to try and dissuade Hitler is by appealing to his immediate superior, Walter von Brauschitz, who was the commander-in-chief of the German army. Beck tries to persuade von Brauschitz to dissuade Hitler from taking a step which he believes would be calamitous to Germany. And he equally tries to persuade the other German generals to resign with him. After two months of Beck briefing against him, Hitler's had enough and summons Beck's boss, Brauschitz, to the Berghof. Brauschitz is a very different man. He's nowhere near as strong morally as Beck. He's very much under the shade of Hitler. He's slightly intimidated by Hitler and he is not willing to stand up to him. Hitler is furious. He's furious about what Beck suggested and stirring things up against his plan and he tells Brauchitsch to get rid of him. So violent is this confrontation that there are some people on the patio outside listening to it, and they're so embarrassed, they go indoors. 
What you see here is something of a typical tactic for Hitler to lose his rag in public situations and use that sense of social embarrassment and humiliation to maneuver people. Today, the bullying works once again. Beck resigns. The army is now firmly under Hitler's control and he's on war footing. Problem dealt with, Hitler settles down to some relaxation at the Berghof. He's a creature of habit, and today is very much like every other. Hitler wakes late at the Berghof. He even refuses to allow his guests to have baths in the morning because the very noisy water pipes run past his bedroom and he doesn't want to be woken up. He has a rather sweet tooth, so the breakfast will be milk and biscuits and perhaps some chocolate before attending meetings in the Great Hall between 11 and 2 o'clock in the afternoon. At lunchtime, him and his guests sit around the dinner table. You can tell who's in Hitler's favour because he has his favourite sitting opposite him, to his left and to his right. Hitler's a vegetarian, so he'll just have a plate of vegetables for lunch. During the course of lunch, he often tends to bore his guests with diatribes on how brilliant a vegetarian diet is. More meetings follow in the afternoon, followed by a trip to the tea house. Where he has hot chocolate and apple cake, and then he's driven back to the Berghof whilst the others have to walk. Dinner will be at 8.30, followed by a film night. Now, Hitler's a real movie buff. He absolutely loves classics such as King Kong, but also he loves Disney cartoons as well. Goebbels has made a gift to him of several Mickey Mouse films, which he seems to enjoy. After they've watched a movie, Hitler and his guests sit by the fireplace where Hitler talks about his favourite subject, himself. He basically gives a lecture to whoever his unfortunate guests are for hours at a time, and most of them are very relieved when they can finally go to bed. But this period of relaxation doesn't last. Two days later, on the 2nd of September, Hitler's joined at the Berghof by the leader of the Sudeten Germans, Konrad Henlein. Throughout that summer, Hitler has been pulling Henlein's strings, instructing him to make increasingly impossible demands of the Czechoslovak government. But. Shortly after Henlein arrives, news comes which confounds Hitler and delights Henlein. This is the surprising news that the Czech government will give self-rule to the Sudeten Germans as long as they remain part of the Czechoslovak state. Henlein is amazed, flabbergasted. He's absolutely surprised to have got what he's asked for. And he says, they've given us everything. Henlein thinks they've won. But this isn't what Hitler wants. Hitler's not interested in compromise or negotiations. He doesn't even just want the Sudetenland. He wants the whole of Czechoslovakia. Hitler tells Henlein to reject the Czech's offer and exclaims, long live war, even if it lasts two to eight years. The very next day, Hitler summons his generals to the Berghof. Hitler tells his generals to set the 1st of October as the date of the invasion. But Hitler knows he still needs to spin events so that it looks like he has no choice but to invade, that he's been provoked by the Czech government's intolerable behavior. In just a week's time, he has the perfect opportunity. Hitler's on his way to Nuremberg for the most important date in the Nazi calendar. The Nuremberg rallies are an annual celebration of the Nazi party, attended by Nazi party members, government officials, the military, and usually this takes the form of a large parade. The Nuremberg rallies are a demonstration of power not only to the German people, but also to the world, that this is a new Germany, a Germany that is strong, 
a Germany that will not be defeated. It is pure megalomaniac theatre. Hitler understands the power of political theatre. He knows that his public image is all important. He's been perfecting it right from the start. Hitler is reluctantly on his way to the Munich studio of a local photographer. For the first time in his political career, he's going to allow himself to be photographed. Hitler decides to be photographed by Heinrich Hoffmann, so just by one photographer who he knows, who he trusts, and indeed who he can control. It's the beginning of a successful relationship that will mold Hitler's public persona. Hoffmann tries to dress him in various clothes. He tries him in a lederhosen. And that doesn't really work out, so they settle on Hitler's suits, which create a very powerful image. And they also look at the gesticulations and the various forms of mannerism that Hitler's got. And they try and weed out those that are too overblown or too ridiculous. What we end up with is a stiff posture, his arms folded, his brows knitted, his lips pressed thin, and that signature neatly trimmed moustache. Fifteen years later, Hitler has perfected his image as the saviour of Germany. A man of the people who's also a visionary genius. This year's Nuremberg rally gives Hitler the perfect showcase. 1938 seems the biggest Nuremberg rally yet. Six days of celebrations, parades, jubilation in the street, and everybody's looking forward to Hitler's speech. Hitler's public speaking technique has been honed over many years, so it's really fine-tuned by 1938. He starts, first of all, by saying nothing. He'll begin quietly, almost getting the audience to lean into what he's saying. Then builds in rhythm and pitch becoming increasingly passionate and agitated until he's flailing his arms around and shouting. Sweat's pouring off him. You know, he's almost in a messianic trance. He's got to this crescendo where he delivers his final point. And then he kind of slumps. And it's not just an act, actually. He's physically and mentally exhausted. And this has a fantastic effect on audiences. They swoon, some people even faint, and they cry with passion. In his final speech of the rally, Hitler addresses the Sudeten problem. He works himself into an absolute fury about what are essentially imagined atrocities being committed by the Czechs against the German minority in Czechoslovakia. He claims that they are trying to wipe them out, annihilate them. He hurls insults at the Czechoslovak president and tells the German people that he will have the Sudetenland by the 1st of October. Hitler's a past master at stirring people up. And with these words, he deliberately throws a grenade into the heart of the Sudetenland. The next day, the German-speaking people in the Sudetenland rise up, attacking police stations, rioting on the streets, asking for their savior to rescue them from persecution. The Czechoslovak government 
respond by imposing martial law in the region and ten Sudeten Germans are actually killed. Events are unfolding exactly as Hitler has planned. He claims the Czechs are terrorizing the German minority. Now, he has the excuse he's been looking for. Europe is now on high alert, as Hitler stirs up the crisis in Czechoslovakia. In a bid to defuse the situation, the British Prime Minister, Neville Chamberlain, makes an unusual request. He sends word to Hitler, asking if he can come and visit him in person for the first time. Neville Chamberlain is the quintessential English gentleman, very refined, always with his umbrella, very immaculately dressed, very cautious, careful of his words. Neville Chamberlain is desperate to avoid war at any price. World War I was meant to be the war that ended all wars, and the trauma and impact of the First World War is still in the minds of the British government and people. This is not an age when leaders jump on and off aeroplanes to confer with each other, and if he is to avert what seems like an inexorable drift towards war, what is required is something totally out of the ordinary. And taking his first flight across Europe to intercede with Hitler is that sort of dramatic gesture. My policy has always been try to ensure peace and the Führer's ready acceptance of my suggestion encourages me to hope that my visit to him will not be without result. Chamberlain flies to Munich and travels by train to Berchtesgaden. The whole journey to uh, Berchtesgaden, they're on a parallel track, are trains full of guns and tanks and military rolling stock, reminding Chamberlain that Nazi Germany is now a really powerful military nation. Chamberlain meets with Hitler at the Berghof shortly after 5 p.m. It's pouring with rain and the sky's dark. A storm is brewing and Hitler's behavior matches the weather. The meeting between Hitler and Neville Chamberlain is almost Monty Python-esque. We have Hitler arrayed in a military uniform with his medals, perspiring with vexation. Neville Chamberlain attempting to be cool uh, with a kind of British reserve. Hitler's in a very bullish mood. He begins by completely exaggerating the number of Sudeten fatalities, saying 300 have been killed. And as a result of this, Germany is determined to do something about it. It's, it's not going to stand idly by. He's effectively a threatening invasion. And Chamberlain is flabbergasted. He looks at Hitler. And Chamberlain was not afraid of anyone. He says, why have you brought me here? If that was what you wanted, he said, a settlement of this matter by force, you should never have brought me here. You've brought me here under false pretenses. And Hitler begins to calm down and says to Chamberlain that he only actually wants Sudetenland territory. Hitler says, out of great respect to you, if you are prepared to persuade the Czechoslovaks that the Sudeten Germans should be allowed to be independent or join with the Reich if they wish, then I am prepared to uh, go along the route of peace. And Chamberlain's response is, well, I'll take it to the Allies and my government and see what comes of it. And so that's the end of the first meeting at the Berghof. No sooner has Chamberlain left the room than Hitler claps his hands together in delight. It was all an act. Hitler's a very good actor and indeed a very good manipulator. He's able to change his mood at whim to give the kind of impression that he wants to. He can become a bully if he needs to become a bully. He can not be a bully when he wants to be. He's more of a kind of sociopath, really. He knows exactly what he's doing. 
Hitler believes he's played a blinder. He tells the assembled company that he has backed this dried up civilian into a corner. He thinks that if the British are willing to allow the Sudetenland to cede from the rest of Czechoslovakia, then obviously the Czech government are going to refuse that, and that gives him his excuse to invade. So he thinks he's got it all sewn up. But Chamberlain doesn't fall into Hitler's trap. Instead, he pulls the rug out from under him. Six days after the meeting, Hitler's back in Berlin. He hears news he hasn't been expecting. The British and French governments rather call Hitler's bluff at this point by convincing the Czechoslovak government to cede the Sudetenland to Hitler. Of course, this is not what Hitler wants. Hitler doesn't want just the Sudetenland. What he wants is the whole of Czechoslovakia. So, Hitler presents Chamberlain with even more demands. The Czechs must leave the Sudetenland immediately. German troops will go in on the 1st of October. War with Britain and France now seems closer than ever. With just five days to go to the planned invasion, Hitler gives a speech at the Berlin Sport Palace in front of a crowd of 20,000. He rants and raves. He's described as shrieking like a banshee. He says that if the British and French don't agree, then, then they can have war. People describe him as almost losing control. <laughs> This is an unusual instance of where his true self is shown. He's very good at hiding his true self, what he really wants. The mask slips briefly, but it slips enough for those who are watching to realize the true essence of Hitler. Around noon the next day, Chamberlain's advisor, Horace Wilson, visits Hitler in the Reich Chancellery. Horace Wilson brings a message to Hitler that the Czechs have rejected his terms, that they will hand over the Sudetenland, but he must renounce the use of violence. Hitler refuses, and Wilson counteracts that by saying that if Hitler does not stand down, that Britain and France will come to the aid of Czechoslovakia. This news stops Hitler in his tracks. Hitler's really surprised by this because he just doesn't believe that Britain and France would do that. He thinks that Britain and France won't risk a general war. But nevertheless, this warning does unnerve him to a certain extent. I think it's possible to see that this is a moment where doubts begin to enter his mind. Hitler has a choice. Back down or invade and risk dragging Britain and France into a devastating war with Germany. The world holds its breath as Hitler decides whether to throw the dice or not. Next time, Hitler's confidence grows as he plots the next stage of his master plan. For the first time, he's actually talking in terms of war and the Jews in the same breath and edges the world closer to disaster. <laughs>